Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 94, STS-51L Part 3, Normalization of Deviance. Last time, we did a deep dive on the design of the solid rocket booster's field joint and how under the right conditions it was possible to fail. We learned how these conditions arose on the final flight of Challenger leading to the catastrophic failure of the joint and the loss of crew and vehicle. We learned the direct cause of the accident and what physically happened. But that only left us wondering how this disaster was able to happen in the first place. Today, we will try to answer that difficult question. I know I said this at the start of our Challenger coverage, and I've been told that at times I emphasize this too much, but I have one quick reminder slash disclaimer. The why of the Challenger accident is an enormous and incredibly complex topic, so I'm gently reminding you that I'm not a real historian, and while I do put a lot of effort and research into these episodes, I also have an actual job and can only go so far. I also don't want this podcast to just become the Challenger show, so today's coverage will be accurate, but by necessity will only skim the surface. If you'd like to go deeper and learn more on your own, I highly encourage it, and we'll list some useful resources near the end of the episode. But back to the task at hand. Before we can start to answer what happened to Space Shuttle Challenger, we need to introduce a new group that we haven't mentioned much so far, Morton Thiokol. These days, Morton Thiokol is part of Northrop Grumman and no longer exists as an independent entity, so you could be excused for not knowing what it was, but they've actually been with us on the show for quite a while. That's because Morton Thiokol manufactured the shuttle's solid rocket boosters. Morton Thiokol Incorporated started out as just the Thiokol Corporation back in the late 1920s, after a couple of chemists trying to make something else accidentally stumbled across a useful polymer, which they dubbed Thiokol. It was eventually realized that this polymer was actually pretty useful at making solid rocket propellant, and the company became a major producer of propellant for these simple, reliable rockets. In fact, Thiokol's propellant was a key part of the success of Explorer 1, America's first satellite. In the early 1980s, they were acquired by the Morton Norwich Company, becoming Morton Thiokol. Weirdly enough, the Morton and Morton Thiokol is the same as the Salt brand, the one with the girl with the umbrella on it. Their company's slogan was even Salt, Specialty Chemicals, and Aerospace, which sounds like something from Aperture Labs and is really bizarre to me. Anyway, Morton Thiokol, or just Thiokol for short, is important to our story, because in the mid-1970s, Thiokol won the contract for the gargantuan SRBs that would help to lift the space shuttle off of the pad and above much of the atmosphere, leaving the main engines to carry it onto orbit. As a NASA contractor, they were paid to produce a specific product, document the process, perform testing on the boosters, answer questions from NASA civil servants, and generally make sure that the boosters were doing what they were supposed to safely, reliably, and on budget and schedule. And so far, for the most part, it seemed like they had done a good job at that. At the time of the accident, Morton Thiokol was under a significant amount of pressure from a few different sources. They were trying to prepare the lighter-weight, filament-wound casing solid rocket boosters for use on the West Coast, which also came with a lengthy verification and qualification program. At the same time, they were making a big push to ramp up production in order to support the increasing flight tempo expected in the next few years. If NASA ever wanted to launch 20 times in a year, they were going to need 40 SRBs. And even with refurbishment, that's a lot. And lastly, they were under pressure because NASA was considering opening competition up for a second source of SRBs. So this is a company that's starting to stretch itself a little thin, while also desperate to appear to have everything more than under control, in order to retain the sole source contract for the SRBs. Nothing is easy in aerospace, and plenty of other companies are also under pressure, so it doesn't excuse anything we're about to talk about, but it's important to put yourself in the same headspace as the people you're trying to understand. The way I see it, there were two opportunities to prevent the Challenger disaster, which I'm going to call the long-term and the short-term. The long-term opportunity began in 1977, when design issues with the SRB field joint were first noted. Rather than clamping the joint shut as expected, when the boosters ignited, they would flex the other way, slightly opening the joint. There had been some debate among NASA and Thiokol engineers about how the joints would behave, 
but once a full-scale hydrostatic test was done, the debate was over. At ignition, the joint would bend slightly outwards, pulling away from the O-rings and making the joint harder to seal. To be honest, it seems like this should have been the end of it right here, and I'm not entirely sure why it wasn't. Later investigation turned up distressed memos internal to Marshall Space Flight Center from 1978 and 1979 insisting that the joint had to be fixed. I believe the rationale for not fixing it was that since the primary O-ring extruded into the gap and created a proper seal, there was no need to redesign the joint. It's not that they were unaware of the root problem, as evidenced by it being corrected in the filament-wound casing SRBs. They just thought it wasn't critical to fix because it was working. I think it would be fair to call this the start of a process called the normalization of deviance. The phrase was coined by Diane Vaughn, sociologist and author of the book The Challenger Launch Decision. Sure, the joint wasn't working as designed, but it was working, wasn't it? There are other problems to work on, let's move on. The unexpected behavior became normal. It became the new baseline that things were compared against. When we later started seeing blow-by, combustion gases rushing past the rings, it didn't feel that extreme compared to this new baseline. But I bet if blow-by was observed in this 1977 test, the joint would have been immediately redesigned. In time, it would become clear that the seal was, in fact, not working, at least not reliably. On only the second shuttle launch, STS-2, blow-by was observed, an obvious indication that something was wrong with the joints. But still, the seal had held, and no redesign was planned. However, in a clear sign that folks knew that there was a problem, the criticality of the primary O-ring was downgraded from 1R to 1. A system being designated criticality 1 means that if it fails, a loss of crew and vehicle will result. A criticality 1R system means that there is a redundant backup, hence the R, but if they both fail, it's a catastrophic problem. Because the joint rotated so much, the thought was that the secondary O-ring could not be counted on to provide a backup for the primary. Flights continued, and the occasional blow-by, erosion, or heat damage continued to be observed. Again and again the damage was noted, but seemingly overshadowed by the fact that the seal had held and by the relatively minor nature of the O-ring damage. On STS-51C, which was the coldest launch at 53 degrees Fahrenheit, Four instances of O-ring damage were observed, the worst yet. I characterized the response as something like, okay, sure, the secondary O-ring got a little singed, and the primary O-ring got a little worn down, but it was only worn down a little, and it takes a lot before it won't seal at all. The beefy primary O-ring was doing its job, and even when it had trouble, the secondary was there to back it up. No problem. The normalization of deviance continued. Up until this point, I think I can understand how we've gotten this far. I don't excuse it and I don't condone it, but I can understand it. Spacecraft are very complex machines, and not everything is going to work exactly like you expect when designing them. So I can see how this unexpected thing came up, people looked at how bad it was, saw that there appeared to be significant safety margin, and chose to keep their attention on other issues. However, my understanding ends at STS-51B. STS-51B launched in April of 1985, also with Challenger, and when its solid rocket boosters were recovered, engineers were shocked with what they discovered. On the left-hand SRB, the joint connecting the nozzle to the lowest casing experienced a complete failure of the primary O-ring, and 12% of the secondary O-ring had eroded away. This is staggering, and should have been a showstopper right there especially when you consider that this was a nozzle-to-case joint, which is a more robust design than the case-to-case -case joints we've been more concerned about so far. Had the joint taken slightly more time to seal, we would be talking about the Challenger disaster of April 1985. To the credit of all involved, this prompted some alarmed internal memos and the creation of an O-ring task force at Morton Thiokol. This was good, Unfortunately, the task force never got the support that it really needed. Getting to the root cause of the problem was difficult, because dedicated test equipment was too expensive because the boosters were so big, so tests had to be performed on flight hardware, 
and that meant that hardware was difficult to acquire, took a lot of red tape and bureaucracy to get their hands on, and the testing couldn't damage the hardware since it would eventually be flying. And despite increasingly distressed memos from Thiokol engineer and O-Ring task force member Roger Beaujolais, there was so much other work going on that it was hard to get people's full attention or time. The task force was doing what it could, but with higher priorities like the production ramp-up, the filament-wound SRBs, and other scary issues like the nozzle lining erosion we mentioned earlier, it simply wasn't given the attention that it needed. Later investigation revealed that around this time, information that should have been shared between different groups was not. I don't have the time or desire to get into the complex inner politics of NASA, and I don't want to speculate as to why this lack of information sharing happened, because I simply can't see into people's minds and there is no way to know their true motivations. But it appears that some people on the NASA side of the SRB program were not escalating issues outside of their center. The prevailing attitude seems to be, yes, we have a problem, but we can figure it out on our own. There's no need to worry other centers or headquarters with this. This trap of wanting to fix a problem before letting everyone know about it is an easy one to fall into, but there's a reason that chains of command exist. 51B spawned the O-Ring Task Force and some presentations to NASA HQ, but somehow the circuit just didn't close. The task force was working, but didn't have enough resources. HQ was looped in about joint concerns, but details about the influence of temperature on the O-ring were omitted. And even as work progressed on this issue, it was focused in the wrong direction. Memos at the time indicate a belief that the joint issues were perhaps being caused by a new type of heat-resistant putty that was being used in the joint, or perhaps from assembly problems. These also needed to be investigated, but with the benefit of hindsight, we know that they weren't the biggest danger. It was the sensitivity to temperature. The long-term opportunity doesn't completely revolve around the SRB joint itself, either. There were plenty of signs that the program was setting itself up for disaster and someone, somewhere, needed to say stop. As just one example, remember how the previous flight, STS-61C, was supposed to land at the Kennedy Space Center? because they thought they finally fixed the problem with the nose gear brakes? Well, due to weather, it ended up landing at Edwards. And it's probably good that it did, because extensive brake damage was later discovered. But this is pretty scary, because STS-51L was the next mission that was going to attempt to land at Kennedy, but folks working on that mission had no idea about Columbia's brake trouble. The information got to the right person at Johnson the day before the launch, and the full extent of the damage was only learned on the 30th, what would have been flight day 3. New information about what the orbiters could and could not handle was being learned all the time, but with the increasing flight tempo, there was just no way to ingest it all. They were essentially trying to run an X-plane program and an operational service at the same time. The other big opportunity to stop this disaster was the short term. With this, I'm referring to the events that took place on the night before the launch. When engineers back at Morton Call headquarters heard the weather forecast for the morning of the launch, they were alarmed at the frigid temperatures being predicted. Several of them got together to discuss the situation and all agreed that the low temperatures had the potential to slow down the O-ring sealing process and could be disastrous. They wanted to recommend delaying the launch. For each flight, Thiokol would send a representative to the Kennedy Space Center to be on hand to answer questions, sign paperwork, and generally be the person responsible. In this case, that was the director of the Solid Rocket Motor Program, Alan McDonald. The Thiokol engineers called McDonald and expressed their concern, and he said he'd get them more detailed weather information and work with other people on site to arrange a conference call between the Kennedy Space Center, Marshall Space Flight Center, and Morton Thiokol headquarters in Utah. One important note, while this call connected Kennedy, Marshall, and Thiokol, only people from Marshall and Thiokol were involved. It's just that some of the Marshall and Thiokol people were on site at Kennedy to support the launch. There was a brief teleconference around 5.45 p.m. with some of the stakeholders, but they concluded that the needed people were not on the call and they should wait for the later telecon. The second teleconference began on January 27th at 8.45 p.m., the evening before the launch, 
less than 13 hours before the scheduled liftoff. On the call were most of the stakeholders of the SRB program. There were a couple of dozen people on the call, but I'll just list a few. For NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, there was George Hardy, the Deputy Director of Science and Engineering, Stan Reinartz, Manager of the Marshall Space Shuttle Project Office, Larry Malloy, Manager of the SRB Project, and for Martin Thiokol, there was Jerry Mason, Senior Vice President of Wasatch Operations, where the SRBs were manufactured, Joe Kilminster, VP of the Space Booster Program, Bob Lund, VP of Engineering, Roger Beaujolais, member of the Joint SEAL Task Force, Arnie Thompson, Supervisor for Rocket Motor Cases, and Alan McDonald, Director of the Solid Rocket Motor Project. These teleconferences, which I'm just going to call telecons for short, had not been anticipated, and this was an era before PowerPoint had taken over the world, so the slides were faxed to Kennedy, with many being handwritten in the hours leading up to the meeting. The Thiokol contingent presented their concerns and reasoning, including a history of issues with the joint. They showed data indicating that the lower the temperature got, the harder the O-ring became, thus increasing the time required to seal the joint. But at the same time, it wasn't crystal clear what was happening here. Mild blow-by had been observed even on a warm launch day. In retrospect, part of the confusion was due to the unpredictable nature of the heat-resistant putty, which sometimes created a pathway to the rings, and sometimes didn't. They couldn't prove a direct cause-and-effect relationship of if cold, then blow-by, but could make reasonable extrapolations from the data that they did have. The Thiokol team concluded with several pieces of supporting data and their recommendations. The data noted, Temperature was not the only factor determining blow-by. STS-51C had severe blow-by with a calculated O-ring temperature of 53 degrees Fahrenheit. Development motors had been fired as low as 47 degrees without blow-by, but they had their putty repaired before firing. Quote, at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, blow-by could be experienced in case joints, unquote. Temperatures for Challenger's SRBs were expected to be 29 degrees at 9 a.m. and 38 degrees at 2 p.m. It's not noted here, but I'll remind you that liftoff was originally scheduled for 9.38 a.m. and was eventually pushed to 11.38 a.m. And lastly, quote, have no data that would indicate SRM-25 is different than SRM-15 other than temp, unquote. In this, they're saying that the only difference between the boosters on 51C and 51L would be the temperature, which I think is pointing out that nothing has been done to alleviate this problem, so they should expect the cold to make it worse. Their final slide included their recommendations, which I'm just going to read in its entirety reminding you that SRM-15 refers to the damaged SRB from STS-51C. Recommendations. O-ring temp must be greater than or equal to 53 degrees Fahrenheit at launch. Development motors at 47 to 52 degrees Fahrenheit with putty packing had no blow-by. SRM-15, the best simulation, worked at 53 degrees Fahrenheit. Project ambient conditions, temperature and wind, to determine launch time. This is important, so I'm going to restate what Thiokol is trying to say in slightly different language. Blow-by is a known issue that seems to be antagonized by cold temperatures. Yes, we've seen it at warmer temperatures, but it gets worse when it's colder, with the worst damage we've seen happening in the coldest temperatures. The 51L launch is expected to be much, much colder than any other launch or test. There is no way of telling how the O-rings will behave, but since they seem to get worse in the cold, we recommend that it be at least as warm as the coldest launch. And based on the weather forecast, there's a good chance of hitting those temperatures late in the afternoon on the 28th anyway, so let's delay. In response, NASA SRB manager Larry Malloy began to push back, questioning the logic used to arrive at the no-go recommendation. George Hardy, the Deputy Director of Science and Engineering at Marshall, said he was, quote, appalled at Thiokol's recommendation. But he also said that he would not override Thiokol and push for a flight if they did not agree. Malloy then said something that I think sums up the spirit of this meeting. Quote, My God, Thiokol, when do you want me to launch? Next April? A discussion then followed on the nuances of the recommendation, 
Shuttle Project Office Manager Stan Reinartz said he thought the SRBs were qualified from 40 to 90 degrees, so this 53 degree floor was not consistent with that. Which is true, but I'm not sure why he brought this up, since the 40 degree floor also isn't consistent with a 29 degree launch. Discussion went back and forth about when blow-by had been observed, under what conditions, if the temperature was really an important factor, and whether the secondary ring would seal if the primary failed. There were questions on what the temperature even meant. Was it the O-ring itself? The ambient temperature? The mean bulk temperature of the propellant? This was important because the propellant had so much thermal inertia that it was unlikely to be overly affected by the overnight low temperatures. The tiny O-rings on the edge of the metal casing, though, surely would be affected far more. Nobody was sure that the part the temperature limit applied to had even been precisely defined. At one point in his protests, Malloy said, The eve of a launch is a hell of a time to be generating new launch commit criteria. So, wait, what just happened here? In every NASA meeting I've ever read about or been in, everything is oriented around proving that what you're doing is safe. Yes, this code will work. This filter will converge. This antenna can slew fast enough. Or this joint will seal. But somehow, that got turned around in this meeting. Rather than demanding that Morton Thiokol prove that the joint was safe to fly, some of the NASA managers were now insisting that they prove it was not safe to fly. This is a critical moment, and it's not at all how things are supposed to work. Some of the people in the meeting later said they didn't even realize it had happened until later. Engineers opposed to the launch adopted a defensive posture, and the managers, who were later accused of browbeating Thiokol into reconsidering, would swear up and down that it had not been their intent to strong-arm them into agreeing with the launch. I can't look inside their heads, and we'll talk a little about motivation in just a bit, but regardless of how it happened, this meeting had suddenly flipped. And I think this is truly the moment that Challenger was lost. The folks at Thiokol asked for a five-minute break so that they could reevaluate their data, and they muted their phone. Now an internal company discussion, the managers and engineers tried to decide what to do. Roger Beaujolais and Arnie Thompson, two of the engineers who knew this issue best, repeated their impassioned arguments against the launch. They showed the data and reiterated the risk of wandering into this realm outside of all engineering knowledge. The engineers could not prove the danger. They couldn't draw a one-to-one connection of if you launch, the SRB will fail. They just didn't have that data. But they did have data from other flights. They had intimate knowledge of the joint, and they were the people with the experience and intuition who you'd turn to for a technical decision like this. While not all the engineers in the room were as vocally opposed to the launch as Beaujolais and Thompson, none of them spoke up in support of the launch either. Finally, Thiokol's Senior VP of Operations, Jerry Mason, said that the data had been presented and it was time to make a management decision. At this point, he turned to Bob Lund, the Vice President of Engineering, a role that straddles engineering and management, and said something that shocks me to this day. He told him, It's time for you to take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. About 30 minutes after the five-minute caucus began, Thiokol came back onto the telecon and said that they had reconsidered their position and were now able to support a decision to launch. A core part of their new rationale was that even though the O-ring damage on STS-51C had been severe, much more of the ring would have to erode before it would fail to seal. In essence, they were saying, sure, the ring might burn off a bit, but enough should be left that it should still work. The NASA side asked them to put their decision into writing and fax it over. Their final assessment was a series of bullet points that read in full, Calculations show that SRM-25 O-rings will be 20 degrees colder than SRM-15 O-rings. Temperature data not conclusive on predicting primary O-ring blow-by. Engineering assessment is that colder O-rings have increased effective durometer, harder. Harder O-rings will take longer to seat. More gas may pass primary O-ring before the primary seal seats relative to SRM-15. 
demonstrates ceiling threshold is three times greater than 0.038 inch erosion experienced on SRM-15. If the primary seal does not seat, the secondary seal will seat. Pressure will get to secondary seal before the metal parts rotate. O-ring pressure leak check places secondary seal in outboard position, which minimizes sealing time. Morton Thiokol Incorporated recommends STS-51L launch proceed on 28 January 1986. SRM-25 will not be significantly different than SRM-15. Thiokol VP of Space Booster Programs Joe Kilminster signed the agreement, faxed it to the Kennedy Space Center, and that was that. In the aftermath of the accident, a presidential commission was formed to investigate what had happened and why. This was important because the commission was independent from NASA. NASA would conduct their own investigation, but with an independent investigation, there would be more credibility to their findings. No matter how good a job NASA did, people would think twice about a report resulting from the agency investigating itself. The Presidential Commission of the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident, as it was formerly known, was formed in early February 1986 at the direction of President Reagan. The commission soon became known as the Rogers Commission, after the chairman of the commission, William Rogers, former Secretary of State and Attorney General. Joining him were 13 engineers, scientists, executives, and pilots, and I think you'll recognize a few of them. The Vice Chairman, Neil Armstrong, Gemini 8 and Apollo 11 astronaut and first person to set foot on the moon. Dr. Sally Ride, STS-7 and STS-41G astronaut and the first American woman in space. And Dr. Richard Feynman, a Nobel Prize winning physicist. The commission was given the task to review the circumstances surrounding the accident to establish the probable cause or causes of the accident and develop recommendations for corrective or other action based on the Commission's findings and determinations. The Commission held its first meeting on February 6th and began the work of getting to the bottom of what happened. We don't have time to go through every twist and turn of the Commission, but there are two dramatic moments that I'd like to point out. One you've probably heard of, and one that might be new to you. The one you've likely heard of, and that several listeners mentioned they were looking forward to hearing about, was a demonstration performed by the somewhat of a maverick Dr. Feynman. During a public hearing on February 11th, Feynman pulled the O-ring material out of a model of the field joint using some pliers, compressed it in a small clamp, and set it in some ice water. He then addressed NASA SRB manager Larry Malloy, saying, quote, I took this stuff that I got out of your seal and I put it in ice water, and I discovered that when you put some pressure on it for a while and then undo it, it doesn't stretch back. It stays the same dimension. In other words, for a few seconds at least, and more seconds than that, there is no resilience in this particular material when it is at a temperature of 32 degrees. I believe that has some significance for our problem. Every time I've heard this story, it was in the context of Feynman blowing the lid off of the true cause of the accident, the lack of resilience in the cold O-rings. It was flashy, direct, and easy for anyone to understand. Here's the thing, though, and I say this as a big fan of Dr. Feynman. This demonstration didn't do that, at least not that I can see. The commission had already been honing in on the sluggish O-rings, at least since the previous day. On February 10th, the commission asked Malloy several questions about the effects of temperature on the joint and the O-rings. They didn't quite realize the importance of it yet, but they were on the right track. But then the other dramatic moment that I wanted to talk about happened. Malloy was testifying and seemed to have glossed over the fact that Morton Thiokol had initially recommended against the launch, specifically citing the cold O-rings. He mentioned that Thiokol had some concerns, but skipped right to them eventually signing off and faxing documentation of their approval. Wanting to set the record straight, Morton Thiokol's director of the Solid Rocket Motor Project, Alan McDonald, raised his hand to interject. Eventually, Malloy said, Mr. Chairman, Alan McDonald from Morton Thiokol wants to make a point. McDonald got up and explained how the telecon the night before the launch had been set up to discuss concerns about low temperatures. He said, quote, The recommendation at that time from the data that was sent out from Thiokol was not to launch below 53 degrees Fahrenheit because that was our lowest acceptable experience base, 
and did demonstrate some blow-by from a year ago, and also we had some data that indicated the poor resiliency of the response of the VTON, the rubber, seal to low temperatures. So that was the first transmittal of information saying you should be aware of that and where the data was discussed, end quote. One member of the commission asked what the actual temperature was, and Molloy responded that by Thiokol's calculations it was 29 degrees. Chairman Rogers then said to McDonald, seemingly surprised, Could you stand up again and say that a little louder so we can hear it? I'm not sure we all understood what you said. What McDonald had just done was potentially derail his entire career in order to stand up in public and set the record straight. Morton Thiokol had initially recommended against the launch due to the impact of cold temperatures on the O-rings. It was only changed after a back and forth with NASA. And Thiokol upper management didn't seem to be offering that up. It actually reminds me of how North American aviation took the brunt of the blame from the Apollo 1 accident in order to maintain good relations with NASA. It's possible, and I emphasize I have no way to know, that Thiokol was more willing to appear that they had made a mistake than to accuse their biggest customer. Would the commission have ended up figuring this out anyway? Maybe. Maybe even likely. But this guy going out on a limb like this really took some guts. And I hope that if I'm ever in a similar situation, I can respond in a similar way. In the days that followed, McDonald provided more critical testimony to the commission. In the next couple of weeks, I'll be posting a supplemental with some of that testimony. In June, the commission presented their findings. These findings are basically how I've been able to write the previous episode in this one. It's the primary reason we know what we know. I highly encourage you to read the final report yourself, since I found it to be surprisingly readable and extremely interesting. The report explains the origins of the shuttle, the major components, how we know that most of those components aren't responsible for the accident, and what was in fact responsible for the accident, the cold O-rings and faulty joint design. They also found that there had been a failure of communication and flawed decision-making. NASA organizes large projects into levels in order to make them literally manageable. A core mistake was that information did not easily leave the SRB level. Ongoing concern about the joints was not escalated to the overall project management, and the dramatic teleconference between Marshall and Morton Thiok Hall was mentioned only in passing. This isn't a quote, but it was something along the lines of, oh, the contractor had a concern about the temperatures, but reevaluated, and it's no problem. Marshall seemed to have an attitude of, we can fix this problem on our own, there's no need to escalate. This siloing of information is an extremely difficult problem in all large organizations, but in one like NASA, it can be dangerous. The commission made a number of recommendations. There were some obvious ones, like fixing the design of the joint, reviewing the criticality of all items, improving communications, and considering options for launch abort and crew escape. There were also some non-obvious ideas, like encouraging more astronauts to join upper management to help reduce the disconnect between management and the boots on the ground. This explains why so many astronauts moved from a flight suit to a business suit in the aftermath of the accident. The report's parting thought states, The commission applauds NASA's spectacular achievements of the past and anticipates impressive achievements to come. The findings and recommendations presented in this report are intended to contribute to the future NASA successes that the nation both expects and requires as the 21st century approaches. I think that note is a good place to reintroduce Richard Feynman into our story. I think the ice thing is a little overblown, but Feynman did make a critical contribution to the report. Appendix F. Feynman did not really get along with the rest of the commission, and despite some pretty damning findings, thought that they were being too easy on NASA. He eventually threatened to remove his name from the report in protest unless he could add his personal observations, which we now find in Appendix F. Feynman found himself increasingly dissatisfied with NASA's approach to safety and the massive difference in expectations between management and on-the-ground engineers. Feynman noted that when asked to estimate the chance of losing a crew and vehicle, engineers would say roughly 1 in 100. Managers would say 1 in 100,000. As Feynman points out, this is absurd, since it implies that a shuttle could launch every day for almost 300 years before we could expect to see an accident. 
Either the managers were wildly out of touch with reality, or they were trying to force reality to be what they wanted. When you're running a prestigious national space program, nobody wants to hear that there's a 1% chance of losing the crew and vehicle on every flight. That doesn't lead to increased support and sustained funding. I can see how by arranging the statistics in a suitable fashion, one could delude themselves into starting to believe in a myth of shuttle safety. But the fact is that the shuttle was not safe. It never was and it never would be. It was an experimental vehicle designed to scratch against the edge of what was humanly possible. Of course it wasn't safe. But flying a risky mission isn't wrong. People take large risks all the time. Putting a crew on the third ever Saturn V and flying it out to the moon on Apollo 8 was an incredible risk. The difference is that everyone involved knew and understood the risks. The risks were considered, weighed against the benefits, and the risky action was taken. STS-51L was different. The launch director and the crew never learned about the concerns of Roger Beaujolais and others. Feynman noted similarities between the SRB field joint problem and the ongoing issue of cracked turbine blades in the main engine turbo pumps. What was once considered a failure was slowly being considered a normal part of flight. Maybe it was. Maybe those risks could be lived with. But it was important to fully understand the problem. Looking at the O-rings, folks looked at the STS-51C damage and said, oh, the damage could have been three times worse before losing the seal, so we have a three times safety margin. But they didn't. The O-rings weren't designed to erode at all. That's not what a safety margin means. Feynman's report was a taste of hard reality from an outsider with no stake to defend, and was exactly what a lot of people needed to hear. Feynman did have some encouraging remarks about the shuttle software systems. In his estimation, they were doing things right with regards to safety and process, and other systems could learn from them. The cost was that the software was incredibly expensive and time-consuming to create, but they were realistic about that cost, and they got the job done with no problems. He concluded, quote, For a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. Put another way, in a quote well known to us, spaceflight will never tolerate carelessness, incapacity, and neglect. So, what are we to make of all this? I have a few questions that I'll try to answer. Were the folks in the decision chain bad people? This was a question I really wanted to answer for myself. And no, I don't think so. Again, I can't see inside their heads and will never know what they were truly thinking, but I just don't have it in me to believe that they were consciously willing to lose a crew and orbiter in order to stick to some schedule. Even if you thought they didn't care at all about the shuttle and the crew, even if you make them 100% self-interested, it wouldn't make sense to launch and have their component be the one that failed. Nothing could reflect more poorly on them. However, do I think that somewhere in the back of their minds, some of them said, well, this is already a risky program. What's a small amount of extra risk if it means I don't need to explain why we're behind schedule, or why no one's ever heard of this joint problem until now? Yeah, I think some of them probably did. It's important to put yourself in the proper context and try to have empathy and understand people. Empathy, not sympathy. You need to feel what they feel, even if you don't agree with it. If you don't have empathy, you can never have any idea why people do what they do. I don't mean to pick on Larry Malloy, but let's take a quick peek into his head. The previous launch was delayed by an SRB issue that didn't even turn out to be a real issue. They were just being overly conservative. As a result, a much delayed flight was delayed once again, and a congressman had to wait even longer for his personal ride into orbit. Consciously or not, Malloy had a strong incentive to not be the boy that cried SRB wolf again. I think it's possible for a number of people to make small compromises, leading to a big compromise, leading to disaster, without being malicious. Does this mean that I would forgive them? I still have to think about that. How do they not address this joint problem sooner? It's important to put the decision in context, and 
I'm in no way excusing anything. In fact, I think it's outrageous that the joint design made it past the 1977 test that exposed the joint rotation in the first place. But the truth is that there was a staggering amount of technical work involved in flying the shuttle, and the joints weren't the only scary thing calling for attention. The problem was dealing with tile loss, cracked turbo pump blades, brake failures, SRB nozzle erosion, aborts to orbit, you name it. It was easy for noisier, scarier issues to get the mental bandwidth and resources required to address them. How did the teleconference get flipped? How were the engineers suddenly on the hook to prove it was not safe? I don't really understand this at all myself. I don't understand how nobody noticed it was happening, stood up, and said, whoa, wait, this is backwards. I don't know how someone didn't do something crazy, like cut the phone line with scissors to prevent a launch recommendation, or call the press. But sometimes human dynamics aren't always obvious, especially as they're unfolding in real time. And again, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the people there. Of course we know how this happened. Most people don't want to be confrontational. They don't want to stand up at the center of negative attention. And they don't want to make a big deal out of something and be wrong. This is why it's so important to be aware during big decisions and be cognizant that reversals like this can happen subtly. Even Roger Beaujolais, perhaps the fiercest critic of the launch, wouldn't have said, yes, this joint will fail, guaranteed. As Richard Feynman pointed out, five of the joints didn't fail. It was a risk. A risk Beaujolais wasn't willing to take. But he had done all that he could within the bounds of his job. He had escalated it to the top, explained the data, explained the risk. But the choice wasn't his, and so the launch recommendation went forward. Is human spaceflight still worth the risk? Gus Grissom himself said, If we die, we want people to accept it. We are in a risky business, and we hope that if anything happens to us, it will not delay the program. The conquest of space is worth the risk of life. Again, I think context and understanding is critical here. I think if the flight director, mission control, Challenger's commander, and the crew all knew about the added risk of the cold O-rings, and made an informed choice to fly anyway, even with a disaster, this would have been a very different story. Astronauts are heroes for the risks that they take, but when you take away their knowledge, they're no longer able to weigh the risks, and we're not doing right by their bravery and sacrifice. Like I said at the start, unpacking this accident is a lot. If you want to learn more for yourself, I recommend checking out at least the following sources all of which are easily available at any big bookstore or through a quick internet search, and I'll list them in the show notes and eventually on the show's sources page. The Report of the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident, Volume 1. The other volumes are also fascinating, but it's a lot of dense documentation and transcripts and memos and stuff like that. Truth, Lies, and O-Rings by Alan MacDonald. It's a pretty provocative title, but it's a pretty provocative book. MacDonald recounts his own experiences leading up to the accident, the lengthy investigation, and the recovery that follows, all from inside Morton Thiokol. He obviously has a lot of incentive to tweak the story to his advantage, but for what it's worth, I believe him. The Challenger Launch Decision by Diane Vaughn. This focuses a lot more on the cultural issues leading to the accident, and can be a little dense. I actually petered out partway through, but I learned a lot. You can also watch much of the Commission's testimony for free online by going to C-SPAN's website. Just search for William Rogers or Neil Armstrong and it should be pretty easy to find. I'm also planning on including at least Alan McDonald's testimony in a supplemental in the coming weeks. These sources will help you understand some of the stuff that I had no choice but to cut. What life was like at Morton Thigh Call and NASA in the build-up to the accident. A play-by-play of the teleconference from several different perspectives the efforts to physically recover the wreckage of Challenger, and where it is now. Incidentally, if you find yourself at the Kennedy Space Center, head to the Atlantis exhibit and go downstairs. The visitor complex has created a somber and tasteful tribute to both the Challenger and Columbia crews, where you can view some of the orbiter remains for yourself. It's incredibly powerful. If you have any questions about the accident, want to learn more about something specific, need clarification, or want to correct me on something, as always, you can reach me via email at jp at thespaceabove.us. Next time, we will put STS-51L behind us. Not forgotten, but not holding us back. <laughs>
We'll talk about what was done during the 32-month hiatus in NASA human spaceflight, some of the changes that were implemented in the shuttle program, both physical and organizational, what the Russians have been up to in orbit, and we'll set the stage for the return to flight on STS-26. I had originally planned to roll right into STS-26, but if I'm being honest, these Challenger episodes took a lot out of me. It's been incredibly rewarding to finally understand the accident at such a deep level, and hopefully do a good job sharing it all with you, but I could use a light episode to recover. I'd like to conclude our coverage of the Challenger accident by reading an excerpt of the speech delivered by President Reagan five hours after the disaster. Nineteen years ago, almost to the day, we lost three astronauts in a terrible accident on the ground. But we've never lost an astronaut in flight. We've never had a tragedy like this. And perhaps we've forgotten the courage it took for the crew of the shuttle. But they, the Challenger 7, were aware of the dangers, but overcame them and did their jobs brilliantly. We mourn seven heroes. Michael Smith, Dick Scobie, Judith Resnick, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Gregory Jarvis, and Krista McAuliffe. We mourn their loss as a nation together. For the families of the seven, we cannot bear, as you do, the full impact of this tragedy. But we feel the loss, and we're thinking about you so very much. Your loved ones were daring and brave, and they had that special grace, that special spirit that says, Give me a challenge, and I'll meet it with joy. They had a hunger to explore the universe and discover its truths. They wished to serve, and they did. They served all of us. We've grown used to wonders in this century. It's hard to dazzle us. But for 25 years, the United States Space Program has been doing just that. We've grown used to the idea of space, and perhaps we forget that we've only just begun. We're still pioneers. They, the members of the Challenger crew, were pioneers. We'll continue our quest in space. There will be more shuttle flights and more shuttle crews, and yes, more volunteers, more civilians, more teachers in space. Nothing ends here. Our hopes and our journeys continue. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us by the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. 